Today is part three of this whole historical base thing that we've been doing. We started off with part one in 1935 through to 1969. Then in the last, the second part of the series, we looked at the 1970s. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the 80s. Essentially, just be afraid. Be very afraid. The 80s are back. So after rampaging through the 1970s, Queen were already considered rock royalty. And on June 30th, 1980, they unveiled their eighth studio album, The Game, which obviously featured their smash hit and bass guitar anthem, Another One Bites the Dust. He's a killer example of John Deacon's solid and inspirational bass playing, as well as his awesome songwriting as well. It soon got picked by some of the soul radio singers in America, but it was really Michael Jackson, a huge fan of the band, who suggested that they release it as a single, and obviously the rest is history. Now Deacon continued to introduce R&B elements to his bass lines, including the legendary collaboration with David Bowie from their 1982 album Hot Space, which obviously featured Under Pressure. Now, Bowie was probably one of the hippest guys alive on the planet at this point, and also responsible for several classics during his funk period. Ashes to Ashes, the lead single, obviously, from the 1980s, Scary Monster, is one such tune and features the awesome bass playing of George Murray. And let's not forget the 1983 Let's Dance with Carmine Rojas on bass. Okay, so he's here. You called me out last time for not adding him in the 1970s, but with the clean production, tighter songwriting, and excellent tunes, 1980s moving pictures is a fast track way of getting your head around Geddy Lee's awesome bass playing with Rush. The instrumental YYZ is a great place to start, with Geddy and drummer, obviously Neil Peart, trading solo licks, but the bass tone, the bass tone throughout is absolutely killer. <laughs> Long time user of a Ricky 4001. Geddy was also dabbling with a wall at that time and Steinberger basses as well, all while singing too. He can sing and play bass like that. Alien. In 1981, the band released Exit Stage Left, a live album recorded on tour that followed moving pictures. Geddy is as prominent as ever, punching through the notes at a ridiculous pace on that album. Maybe that's why they called it Rush. I don't know. Now, 1980 was also a vintage year for hard rock and metal, and it doesn't get much heavier than the next bassist. I bet you can all guess who it is, the famously hard-living lead singer of Motet. Now, Lemmy's legend is somewhat automatic just for sticking it out and rocking so hard for so damn long. He took copious amounts of LSD as a roadie for Jimi Hendrix in the late, in the late 60s and 1970s, and then as a bass player with the band Hawkins, who actually fired him in 1975 after he was arrested for drug possession on the Canadian border. Lemmy's response was to form Motet. Now, the band's golden era was really, I would say, 1979 to 1983, which really peaked with their most successful studio album, Ace of Spades, in 1980, and their first live album, No Sleep Till Hammersmith, a year later. Now, Lemmy's bass style was also pretty unique as well, combining chords with a super heavily distorted Rickenbacker tone. His amp was a customised 1976 Marshall super bass known as Murder One. Now, Lemmy once said that he set the bass on zero, treble on zero, and his mids on ten. Who knows if that was actually true, but that's what was said. He used a Marshall 1970L 4x15 cabinet and had as many on stage as physically possible. It is easy to see why Motet had the title of the loudest band in the world. Now for many, thrash metal didn't really exist until the formation of Metallica in 1981. Heavily indebted to Motet, a brief shuffling of personnel produced the first solid lineup, which was James Hetfield on guitar and vocals, Lars Ulrich on drums and Kirk Hammett on guitar, and the legendary, obviously you guys know this, Cliff Burton on bass. This period produced some outstanding work, including Kill 'Em All, Ride the Lightning, and in particular 1986's Master of Puppets, one of the best albums of all time. But ultimately, 
Cliff's time was cut short when the band's tour bus crashed in Sweden and he was tragically killed. Now obviously Cliff was no easy act to follow and Jason Newstead was given the job just three weeks after Cliff's death but even on the band's notoriously bass deprived 1988 album and Justice For All, Newstead still managed some significant contributions. Check out To Live Is To Die which sees Newstead playing some assorted bass parts left unfinished by Cliff and sculpting them into a ultra heavy tribute. Now while Metallica were on their way to taking over the world and becoming one of the biggest acts ever, Iron Maiden's full length live album 1985 Live After Death captured the band at their globe spanning peak. Some might say really that Iron Maiden's entire career had been built around the galloping style of bassist Steve Harris. That man has a right forearm made of iron. Now anyone who's tried this technique for any length of time will testify to how how difficult it actually is. Check out Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which has to be the pinnacle of that album. At the time when synth bass ruled, Duran Duran were describing themselves as a cross between the Sex Pistols and Chic and playing rock music with a very, very groovy low end. Their 1982 album Rio featured some huge, huge hits. Obviously, Hungry Like a Wolf, Save a Prayer, and some killing bass lines as well, not least the title track, Rio. Just like that, we were twisting, to be fair, there was an enormous variety of genres for any music fan in the 1980s. Remember that this was a time when the synth keyboards ruled, when computerized sequences were rapidly making ground and bass players feared for their jobs. I'll outplay anybody using the machine or I'll die. The day that the machine outplays me, they can plant me in the yard with the corn. Uh, and I mean it. So retaliation from us guys came mainly with the five string bass, a low B on the bass guitar allowed bassists to match the low C on the synth, which previously went right underneath the low E on a four string bass. Jimmy Johnson, killing bass player by the way, was among the first to use a five string bass with the low B on the Los Angeles session scene, popularizing the instrument with his forward lean infusion on the Alan Holdsworth 1984 album, Tokyo Dream. While well, the golden age of the session scene was really, you know, may have come and gone by the 1980s, there was still a select group of studio bass players who were advancing the tradition of their predecessors. Donald Fagan's 1982 album, The Night Flight, is a classic example of this. This was Donald Fagan's solo debut following his split from Steely Dan partner Walter Becker and brought together a collection of musicians that read like the who's who of top session guys. Anthony Jackson was on this album and shared bass usage with Abel Boreal, Will Lee, Marcus Miller and Chuck Rainey, all giving a masterclass in bass playing on that album. There's some tasty synth bass as well from Greg Fillingains too that you need to check out. The songs are great and every track is a pure joy to listen to. Now another landmark studio album from the early 80s is Toto 4, which was released in the spring of 1982 and received no less than six Grammy Awards a year later. With the original bass player of Toto, David Hungate, moving to Nashville during the recording of the album to spend more time with his family, this was the final album with the original Toto lineup. It's worth mentioning as well that all the band members were regular session greats as well, and the band had actually delayed touring the album because they were involved with the production of Michael Jackson's Thriller, which brings me on nicely to my next pick, Thunder Thumbs himself, ba -ba -ba -ba, Lewis Johnson. So having found fame in the 1970s with his brother Johnson, Lewis Johnson left an imprint on the bass world which was obviously unforgettable. The most enduring hit was probably Stomp from the brother's 1980 album Light Up The Night, but Quincy Jones, who became their manager, also collaborated with them on several key recordings, including The Dude, any Big Lebowski fans out there? In 1981, before laying the foundation for what would become the biggest selling album of all time, Michael Jackson's Thriller in 1982. After Thriller, Johnson was constantly in demand as a session musician and his slap bass lines can be heard on man, all over the place, like Time Exposure by Sandy Clark, Hydra by Grover Washington Jr., Thief in the Night by George Duke, and obviously also check out his bass line for Michael McDonald's 
hit I keep forgetting every time you're near. Johnson played with such power that he regularly blew his bass amp speakers and alongside Larry Graham he remains the godfather of slap bass. Meanwhile, a giant of British bass playing, Mark King, was also paving the way for slap bass in the mainstream 80s pop. Listen to level 42 tracks like Hot Water, and obviously, I know you are thinking this, Love Game. The group notched up 20 UK top 4 hits throughout the 1980s, but it was an appearance on top of the pops playing the Chinese way from their 1985 album Pursuit of Accidents that really sparked an interest in Mark King. Obviously his slap technique is phenomenal. But whether he's playing slap or fingerstyle, everyone wanted to capture a little of Mark's magic. Over the years, he's been responsible for the sale of lorry loads of JDs, Alembics and status graphite headless bases as well. Now synths and drum machines might have dominated pop music in the early 80s, but in Jaco Pistorius' wake came some killing fretless bass players too. Pino Palladino's breathtaking counterpoint on Paul Young's No Parlay album has kept tracks like Every Time You Go Away oozing out of radio speakers ever since 1984. Now obviously Japan were another breath of fresh air and a lot of credit for their distinct sound should definitely go to the bassist Mick Khan. He was completely original in his approach and his sound thanks to the trademark tone of his fretless wall bass. Tin Drum from 1981 is probably the band's finest hour featuring some classic bass parts on songs like Cantonese Boy and Sons of Pioneers as well as the haunting hit single Ghosts. Now elsewhere, Tony Levin's innovations with King Crimson and Peter Gabriel resulted in sounds that had really never been heard on the bass. Take his fretless work on Peter Gabriel's Sledgehammer or his wooden funk fingers on the smash it big time in 1986. And then there's his bass playing on King Crimson's Discipline album in 1981. Now that album opened my eyes and ears to a whole new world of bass playing. Now while we're on the subject of fretless bass, I need to mention obviously Paul Simon's 1986 album Graceland, which featured a killing bass lineup, including Paul Simon himself on six string bass. There are so many amazing tracks to talk about here. Boy in the Bubble, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes, Graceland obviously, and of course the fretless extravaganza on You Can Call Me Out, with uh, Chevy Chase in the music video as well. Can you get any better than that? Now the amazing bass break played by Bikiti Kamalo stunned everyone, although there was more than a little manipulation in the production being heavily compressed and obviously played backwards in parts. Now they actually recorded that track on Bikiti's birthday and as a little gift Paul gave him free reign over what to play in that part, he came up with the part and took it down in one take, but the gag is that the second bar of that solo is actually just the first bar reversed. It's all in the production. Engineer Roy Haley simply flipped the tape over and spliced the two parts together so it is actually physically impossible to play that part correctly. Now probably best known for his work with the band Living Colour, Doug Wimbish can also look back on an esteemed career that started back in the day with Sugar Hill Records in the early 80s. Along with guitarist Skip McDonald and drummer Keith LeBlanc, Wimbish went on to play on some of the biggest hip-hop anthems of the time, including White Lines, Don't Do It, That's The Joint and Apache. A master of bass effects, Doug has also enjoyed an impressive career as a sideman for the likes of Jeff Beck, Mick Jagger, Moss Def, Carly Simon, Seal, uh, Madonna. <laughs> you should also check out Doug's work with Living Colour drummer Will Cahoon as well, as drum and bass act Jungle Funk. Now along with drummer Sly Dunbar, Robbie Shakespeare transformed funk reggae bass into an art form and proved just how energising reggae bass can actually be, even in the digital era. Together, Sly and Robbie have played on thousands and thousands of recordings, and not just with his reggae artists. His Fender, Hoffner Steinberger and Paul Reed Smith basses, always still with flats by the way, have done wonders for Grace Jones, Bob Dylan, Paul McCartney, Sinead O'Connor and a ton of others too. Just grab Nightclubbing by Grace Jones or the Black Uhuru Anthology by Island Records. You'll find out what I mean.
Now, to wrap up the 1980s, I want to pay tribute to three amazing bass players who I actually remember seeing on stage together as the super group of B3 back in 2006, 2007. You guys will probably know. Let me know in the comments when those guys were playing together. And obviously, I'm talking about Stu Hamm, Jeff Berlin, and the amazing Billy Sheehan. Billy's in your face bass style has been forged over a lifetime spent redefining heavy rock. From his early band Talis to stints with Steve Vai, Dave Lee Roth and Niacin to several years on top of the world with Mr. Big. <laughs> It's his bass work on one of my favourite albums of all time, Dave Lee Roth's 1986 solo album, Eatem and Smile, that first got my attention. Wow. Now, also in 1986, the monstrous bass player, Jeff Berlin, released an amazing solo album called Pump It, which showcased his melodic support and solo style, which he was world-renowned for. Boasting some of the most virtuosic bass chops I have ever heard in my life, Jeff Berlin is a bass player with Plenty to say about life and the low end. His career covers some 40 years of music making, including top sideband jobs with the likes of Bill Bruford, Scott Henderson, as well as some amazing solo albums as well. Now, last but by no means least, we have Stu Hamm. And he's enjoyed a lengthy career as a sideman with guitarist Joe Satriani and Steve Vai, who I can remember watching Stu Hamm when I was like 13, watching Joe Satriani, I was like, oh, Joe. You should absolutely check out Stu's solo albums. Kings of Sleep, released in 1989, is a great place to check out his mesmerizing fretwork, which is largely responsible for bringing tapping into the bass world. He really was a game changer. So there you have it guys, that was based in the 1980s. I'm sure I've missed some people out, but remember the 1990s is coming, so they might be getting added to the 1990s, or they might be in the 1970s video that we released just a few weeks ago. What I'll do is put a link in the description to the 1970s videos, the 1935 videos, never burp on camera. And I'll also link as well to the free Scott's Bass Lessons Toolkit, which is an amazing resource of videos telling you how to get a killer bass tone, um, how to set up your bass. I interview an amazing luthier about body woods and neck woods and how that all comes into play. We've got a workshop on how to use the modes to create bass lines and all of that cool stuff. I'll put a link below to that. All you need to do is hit the link and then you can hook yourself up with it completely free. Now, without further ado, obviously, as always, take it easy and I'll see you in the shed.